Jumai, inshallah, let us move to our book, A Blessed Valley. We reached up to page number six. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala Bismillah, let us go. The author, may Allah Ta'ala have mercy on him, said, the Alawis lived live in Hyderabad, a name loosely used by non-Yemenis to refer to an area extending from Bofar, the easternmost province of the days Oman, to the eastern border of north of northern Yemen. Geographers and historians have so differed. That is the southern, furthest southern part of Yemen. That area is the Hyderabad Valley. Mm. Geographers and historians have differed in delineating its borders. Most South Yemenis mean by it the valleys of the north, sometimes extending southwards to include the seaport of El Shihr, but never Aden. Some understand it to mean the valley of Ibn Rashid, Rashid which extends from the tomb of Prophet Hud, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may peace be upon him, in the east, to the walled town of Shibam in the west. The valley runs southeastwardly toward the ocean as Wadi Masila. Its Wadi Masila. Wadi Masila. Its prolongation to the southwest is called Wadi Dawan, mm. commonly pronounced Doan, while its more northerly branch is called Wadi Amd. Shiba. In all of those areas, different families of the Alawis settled in those places. And great scholars, as we will read, came from the different areas. So if you go back to uh, page uh, Roman number 12, there is a map. And there, in that map, you'll see the different towns and areas, right? So on this page here. Uh, pay attention to that map. So when we start talking about the scholars of this land, you will see how much effort they made by sometimes they walked from these different areas to seek knowledge, right? And in these specific cities and areas, you're going to notice great scholars that were like illustrious awliya of Allah and arifin, knowers of Allah and fuqaha and ulama, all of it you're going to find. So just pay attention to that map and put scholars, when we talk about them, where they are in their areas. Mm. Shibam was the residence of the companion Ziyad ibn Labid al-Ansari, anhu, who was entrusted with the governorship of Hyderabad by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. May Allah Taala's blessings and peace be upon him and his family, who had already informed the Muslims that the Yemen was one of the blessed places on earth where faith would take strong roots and where knowledge and wisdom would flourish. He had prayed that Allah Ta'ala should bring the hearts of the people of Yemen, Syria, and Iraq to accept Islam, and he had prayed thrice for God, for Allah Ta'ala, to bless Yemen and Syria, while pointedly refusing thrice to pray for Najd. So this hadith related from Al-Bukhari is an indication uh, that that area of Najd if you read footnote number 12 real quick. Related in Bukhari in his Sahih, Najd is the central plateau of the Arabian Peninsula where today's city of Riyadh is located. Which is the capital city of the Wahhabi kingdom. Uh, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he prayed in this hadith, O oh Allah, bless our Sham and our Yemen. And he did it several times. And he was asked, what about a Najd, O Messenger of Allah? 
And he kept saying, oh Allah, bless our Sham, which is the areas of Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, and Jordan, and our Yemen. And then finally he said, from when they asked him about Najd, he said, that is where the seditions will come from, or the horn of the shaitan will rise from there. And somewhat over 200 years ago, we saw kind of the prophecy of the Prophet وسلم, being fulfilled by a deviant group coming out of that area. Mm. He had also said, <clears throat> Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, may Allah Ta'ala's blessings and peace be upon him and his family. When the Yemeni delegations arrived in Medina to give allegiance, the people of Yemen have come. They are soft hearted. Faith is Yemeni. Understanding religious knowledge is Yemeni and wisdom is Yemeni. The Yemen was therefore well suited to receive the descendants of the Prophet and to offer a spiritual environment that would allow their wisdom to flourish, even as it was also to produce over the years many renowned non aloe scholars and saints. And here, mark this point. Among that area were great scholars, ulama, in the different sciences, and awliya who are not from the family of the Prophet. So you have a thousand years, a thousand years of scholars from in that area generations from the family of the Prophet and from other than the family of the Prophet and they always had a good relationship down to this day. Mm. Unfortunately, the scope of this work does not allow us to include all the influential families as among others, the Amudi, Ba Fadl, and Ba Saudan, commonly pronounced Ba Sudan clans, or such influential individuals as Sheikh Saad as Suwaini, Sheikh Ba Hormuz, Sheikh Ba Jamal, Sheikh Sultana as Zubaydia, and the two Ba Makramas, to name but a few. Many and of the all influential scholars and knowers of Allah in the Hadramaut Valley. Many of the Arabic terms that we frequently use have now become familiar to the English reader, so we no longer use italics for words such as Sunnah, Imam, Sayyid, Sharif, Habib, Hajj, Mu'adhim, and Hadith. Here is something I want to allude to. We have made certain words part of our English vocabulary that are Arabic words, so we don't even translate them. We say we follow the sunnah, or we say he's the imam, or he's the sayyid, or he's sharif, or habib, right? Or we go on hajj, or the mu'adhan, or the hadith, or salah, right? We need to do the same thing for the attributes of Allah. So we can say the attribute of yet, or the attribute of al-istiwa, or the attribute of a nuzul, right? And or the attribute of wajj. And we don't have to translate that so it leads to misunderstandings, which leads to anthropomorphic belief. So just as we have all these other words about creation in Arabic and we leave them as they are, do the same thing with the attributes of Allah Ta'ala to avoid confusion. So when someone says Allah has a hand, say no, Allah has the attribute of yet. Well, yet mean yet. And Allah knows best the reality of his yet. Allah has the attribute. Somebody say, Allah has a face. Say no. He has the attribute of wedge. And Allah knows best the reality of his wedge. When they say he descends, la, he has the attribute of nuzul. And he knows best what his nuzul meant. When they say he established, la, he has the attribute of al-istiwa. And he knows best his attribute of al-istiwa. And this will keep us all safe, inshallah ta'ala. While understanding why we say that, Laysa kamithlihi shayi, that no thing resembles Allah. Mm. Imam Ali Zain al Abidin. So now we're talking about the lineage of the Prophet وسلم, that relates to this particular family, right, of Al Ba'alawi. Here we mention. 
So you have the Prophet وسلم, his daughter Fatima and her husband Sayyidina Ali. From them came Hassan and Hussein. And now from the lineage of Hussein, we go to his son Ali, Zain al Abidin, Ali ibn Hussein, ibn Ali, ibn Abi Talib. Mm. The only male survivor of the Karbala massacre, and thus the ancestor of every Husseini Sayyid on earth today, Imam Ali, anhu, son of Imam Hussein, was born in Medina on the 5th of Shaban of the year 37 AH, 658 CE. His mother was a person. Oh, you gotta remember, he is among the followers of the Sahaba. So his teachers are the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So keep the year 37 AH. His mother was a Persian princess, daughter of the last Persian king. Zamakhshari states in Rabi Allah. Zamakhshari is a famous scholar in Arabic language. And he is often quoted though he followed the way of Al-Mu'tazila in Creed. So the scholars would remind us that when it's for the language and issues of that, Zamaqsari would be mentioned, but not for Creed. Mm. States in Rabi al-Abrar that when the companions returned from the conquest of Persia during the caliphate of Umar, they brought back with them three Persian princesses, the captive daughters of the vanquished Persian king. Umar was about to sell them as slaves when Ali stopped him, saying that daughters of kings should be spared humiliation and although captives should be treated with tact and discretion. Umar agreed, as he always did when Ali spoke, and here you notice something. Go back to the Prophet Sallallahu when he said, Ana Madina Tul'ilm wa Ali Babuha. I am the city of knowledge and Ali is his gate. And remember, as he mentioned, that Umar would always defer to Sayyidina Ali, right? As among the great scholars of Al Madina. And here's the thing. If you remember the statement of Sayyidina Ali, when they questioned him about the different seditions that exist in his time, and he said, and they compared him to Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman, radiallahu ta'ala anhum. And he said, Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman, they had men like me, and I have men like you. I never forget. And they were such a noble companion, radiallahu ta'ala, that the khulafa could count on him. Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman, radiallahu ta'ala anhum, they could count on Sayyidina Ali as an excellent follower, right? And we should emulate that when we think about that. So that our leaders, our imams, when we talk, they listen because we work and we support and we are an integral part of their leadership by being excellent followers and supporters. Now, he set a price which Ali, radiallahu anhu, having made up his mind, paid forthwith. He then gave the first one to Abdullah, son of Umar, radiallahu anhu, and she bore him his illustrious scholarly son. Oh, look at this. So from these captives, one was given to Abdullah ibn Umar. Abdullah ibn Umar was among the scholars of the companions, the son of Umar ibn Khattab, who was known to give legal judgment, legal judgments in al Medina, And a lot of the opinions of the Madahib especially the Maliki school, they come from the route of Abdullah ibn Umar. And his son Salem was a great scholar among the Tabi'een, one of the great scholars of al Madina. Mm. The second he gave to Muhammad, son of Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu, who bore him his son, Al-Qasim. Al Muhammad is also one of the great scholars of Al Medina, who is the grandson of Sayyidina Abu Bakr. Imam Jafar as Sadiq. In early days, their names are going to come up a lot. Imam Jafar as Sadiq's maternal grandfather and one of the most it important. Is a connection to show you that 
Jafar al-Sadiq, who is from the lineage of Sayyidina Ali, they had the connection from him between Abu Bakr and Ali, which shows you that the people of the house and the rest of the companions were one in blood and in following. Mm. And one of the most important scholars of Medina. As for the third, he gave her to his own son, Imam al Hussein, and she bore him Ali, who was to become known as Zayn al Abidin, the adornment of worshippers, as he was known to pray 1,000 rakahs each night. Here, we should write another title Zayn al Abidin, the adornment of the worshippers. He was also known as a Sajjad. Sajjad, meaning the one who prostrates a lot, a lot. And this is because of his habit, 1,000 raka, besides the obligatory prayers and all of the sunnah prayers. In addition to that, he used to pray 1,000 raka a night. 1,000. And so when we start talking about the spiritual efforts of these noble descendants of the Prophet Sallallahu you can see they had these habits from the earliest of their ancestors, like Imam Zain al-Abidin. To the extent that it was related about him, one time he was praying in his house and the houses Adjoin, uh, adjoining his house, his house were caught catching on fire. And he was in the house praying. And the people were saying, Yeah, Ali, the fire, yeah, Ali, the fire. And he didn't come out until they put out the fire. When he came out, they said, Didn't you hear us talking about the fire? And he was in there praying. He said, I was more focused on the fire of the hereafter, the big fire, to worry about the fire in this world such concentration in the prayer. So when we look at that, that is an aspiration to, when we say falling short, look at these types of feats in praying. Like Al-Imam Zain al-Abideen as-Sajjad Ali ibn Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And, and we should try to get our portion of the prayers. So when we didn't reach these high levels, Subhanallah, we know we can endeavor more, inshallah. Now, Imam Ali Zain al Abidin fell sick on the day of Karbala, so that the murderers of his father and family, seeing how close to death he was, neglected to kill him as they had just killed all his brothers and cousins. Allah Ta'ala, mighty and exalted, holding their hearts between his two fingers, turned them away from that. Here, when he's saying holding his heart between his two fingers, this is figure of speech to mean that Allah has controls and he turns the hearts. So it doesn't literally mean that Allah has fingers, so you should highlight that and put the meaning. What is meant, there is a hadith, right? That the hearts of the children are, are controlled by Allah, he turns them whatever way he wills. And they use this term, if you literally translate it, between two fingers. But it's not literal. It's not meant because as we know, so there is always problematic things with literal translations. But keep an understanding that whenever you hear these descriptions about Allah Ta'ala, it has a meaning that's befitting of Allah Ta'ala. And it is not the apparent meaning what rushes to the mind as Imam al nawawi radiallahu ta'ala and who mentioned. So we don't ascribe to Allah uh, physical attributes, meaning that Allah is a body because Allah lays a jisman. Allah is not a body, and he can be not, he cannot be attributed with attributes of bodies. So what is understood here is that the hearts are under the control of Allah Ta'ala, and he turns them as he wills. Mm. 
turned them away from that so that the prayer of his prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may Allah Ta'ala's blessings and peace be upon him, that Allah Ta'ala should bring out of Ali and Fatima, radiallahu anhuma, an abundant and exceptional progeny would be answered. Excuse me, and that his promise, may Allah Ta'ala's blessings and peace be upon him, that his descendants from Hassan and Hussein, radiallahu anhuma, remain the beacons guiding his community would come true and trusted with the secret of the Quran until they would meet with him at the basin at the resurrection. And I want to share something with you. There are some people who see these little translations and they would accuse automatically people of kufr, right? Of disbelief. And this is an extreme. And the same persons, like the translator and like all of those of this descendants, they would laugh at such false attribution to say that they liken Allah to the creation. That would be a joke to them. Like, what did you just say? So have a little insof, a little fairness when dealing with people. Sometimes what you understand is the furthest thing away from the minds of other people, especially their hearts and their belief. Nam. Imam Ali عنه, was constantly in the presence of his Lord. Whenever he started off on pilgrimage and pronounced Labaik, he would lose consciousness, overwhelmed by the awesome pledge he was making, this being one of the spiritual states of the Siddiqun, who, when they the pronounced... Siddiqun are the highest ranks of the awliya, just under the level of the prophets. So in the ranks of the awliya, you have different levels. The highest rank under them is this rank of the sincerely true servants of Allah. Mm. Who, when they pronounce, here I am, Lord, at your command, know that no human being is capable of responding adequately to the call of absolute perfection, the call of Allah Ta'ala. Mm. Whenever he was about to enter the ritual prayer, he turned very pale and trembled. When asked about it, he answered, do you know before whom I am about to stand? It so happened that once a fire broke out in his house as he was in prayer, and such was his spiritual absorption that he remained unaware of the commotion around him. There was constant fear with this. Sayyidina Ali Zain al Abidin, as I mentioned to you. Mm. There was constant fear within the ruling Umayyads that the descendants of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may Allah Ta'ala's blessings and peace be upon him and his family, would rise against them and wrench away their power. On many occasions, when tyranny and deviancy from Sharia became intolerable, such uprisings did in fact occur. Few of these were successful, however. So it was that the caliph Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, he was among the Umayyad uh, rulers. Mm. Ordered Imam Ali, radiallahu anhu, brought to Damascus on the guard in chains. Keep Imam, in mind, when we say Imam Ali here, we're talking about Imam Ali Zain al Abidin. Ali ibn Hussein ibn Ali. Don't mix this Imam Ali to be Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib lived before them. Right? Naam. Imam al Zuhri, Rahimahullah, saw him in this state. Imam al was a great early scholar among the Salaf, who was a famous scholar of Hadith. So whenever you read in the books of Hadith, Ibn Shihab al Zuhri. You want to find that he's always mentioned in the narrations of Hadith. Mm. Saw him in this state when he came to bid him farewell. He wept, saying, Would that I had been in your place. The Imam answered, Do you think that I am distressed by this? Had I wished, none of it would have happened. But it is a reminder to me of Allah Ta'ala, the exalted's torments. Then to prove the truth of his words, he freed his hands and feet from their shackles, saying, I shall submit to this for two days after we leave Medina. Four nights That's later, his... When you see those karamats of the awliya, those special, extraordinary things that happen at the hands of the awliya, which is a part of the belief of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah, that the awliya, they have karamat, they have these extraordinary miracles. So even though they thought they had control of him, he let them know that really I am under the control of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But also he was patient 
with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will for him. And we should learn something from that. SubhanAllah. Mm. Four nights later, his guards returned to Medina searching for him, for he had disappeared. As Zuhri, Rahimahullah, asked them about what had happened. They told him that that they told him that they had rested for the night, keeping him in their midst, but come dawn, he was nowhere to be seen. His chains had been left lying on the ground. When Az-Zuhri, Rahimahullah, met Abdul Malik, Rahimahullah, some time later, the caliph inquired whether he knew anything about this. He told him what he knew, upon which the caliph said, he came to me the day the guards, he came to me the day his guards lost him, saying, what have I to do with you? I said, stay with us, to which he replied, I have no wish to. Then he departed. By Allah Ta'ala, my heart was filled with fear of him. Then Abdul Malik sent a message to Al-Hajjaj, Al-Hajjaj, Ibn, Al Ibn Yusuf. Ibn Yusuf. Ruthless, ruthless, ruthless uh, leader among the Umayyads. His tyrannical his tyrannical and bloodthirsty lieutenant. Stay clear of the blood of the children of Abdul Muttalib, for I have seen that when the children of Abu Sufyan became fond of it, they lasted but a little. He also Let's commanded... Go back to the time of before uh, Islam, right? So Abu Talib is from the family of the Prophet Sallallahu among his grandfathers, right? Abdul Muttalib, uh, excuse me, Abdul Muttalib, and the Umayyads come from Abu Sufyan. Mm. So you have the Hashimi people, Al Bayt, and the Umayyad people. He also commanded him to keep his instructions secret. However, the whole thing was unveiled to Imam Ali's eyes, and he wrote henceforth to Abdul Malik, You have written to Al Hajjaj concerning us the descendants of Abu, Abdul Muttalib on such and such a day a month, commanding him to do such and such a thing, and Allah Ta'ala shall reward you for that. When the imam's servant reached the caliph, the latter found that the imam's letter bore the same date as his to al Hajjaj, and that the two messengers had left their respective towns on the same day. Then Hisham ibn Abdul Malik went to Hajj before assuming the caliphate. He circumambulated the house, but was unable to reach the black stone because of the crowd. He stood aside with his retinue of Syrians. They brought him a chair and he sat down watching the people. Then in came, then in came a fine featured, dignified man heading for the black stone. The people treated him with the utmost respect and made way for him so that he reached the stone and kissed it. One of the Syrians asked, who is this man whom people treat with such reverence? Hisham, jealous and wishing to end the matter, replied, I do not know. Al-Faradah, al faraz Dak, excuse me, the famous poet happened to be there, the custom of poets having always been to frequent the courts of princes. He could not restrain himself and retort it, but I do know him. Who is who is he, O Abu Faraz? Asking the un, asked the unsuspecting Syrian. Al-Faradah, I'm sorry, al faraz Dak, moved by his love for the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. Mm. May Allah Ta'ala's blessings and peace be upon his fam him and his family and angry at the hatred shown to his descendants improvised one of the most powerful poems in praise of Akhul Bayt in the history of Islam, a poem that is still to this day vibrant with the spiritual influx that he must have received at that moment, for he was a poet given to praising the princes of this world and involved in a protracted war of disparagement and slander in verse against his rival, Jaru. At that moment, however, Allah Ta'ala cast into his heart the fire of jealousy for his beloved, the knowledge of the inward reality of Akhubayt and the words to express them. He said, This is he whose footsteps are recognized by the ground of Mecca. The house knows him, the sanctuary and its surroundings. This is the son of the best of all of Allah Ta'ala's servants. This is the pious, the pure, the unblemished, the illustrious. When Quraysh see him, they say, to the noble qualities of this man do all noble qualities aspire. To the summit of honor does he belong, that both Arabs and non-Arabs fail to reach. 
When he comes to greet it, the corner of the house recognizes the touch of his palm and reaches out to grasp it. The 28-verse poem sent Hisham into a rage, for Farazdak spoke of unmatchable merits, a man whose ancestor was the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whose grandparents were Ali and Fatima, radiallahu anhuma, whose father was El Hussein, radiallahu anhu, whose forehead shone with the light of sanctity, whose generosity was already legendary, as were his knowledge. In his face, the light of Wilaya was in his face. SubhanAllah. So that, that all of that worship, those thousand rakats, those good characteristics produced in him a light that shined on the outward, which was intense inwardly. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Now. As for his knowledge and forbearance, the love of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his family were stated clearly to the pivot of faith, whereas to detest them was equally clearly tantamount to disbelief. The point goes. Remember, I told you about his forbearance when that person came and was cursing him and talking bad to him. He said to him, Praise be to Allah who hid from you. What is in me that is worse than what you say? Is there anything I can do to help you? SubhanAllah. One time, Imam Zain al Abidin was sitting in a circle and he had a nice turban on. And there was a person in that session who wanted that turban. So he took his turban off and put it down. And the person snatched it and ran. And Imam Ali was behind him running, saying, say, I accept. Say, I accept, I give it to you. He wanted to protect him from the sin of stealing. SubhanAllah. Allahu Akbar. Now, the poem goes on to say, when the pious are considered, they are seen to be their leaders. When it is asked who the best people on earth are, the answer is them. When Allah Ta'ala is mentioned, they are mentioned after him. And anyone who knows Allah Ta'ala also knows their privacy. From this man's house, religion sprung forth for the guidance of all nations. Allahu Akbar. al farazdaq was imprisoned at the village of Usfan, 50 miles north of Mecca. The imam heard of this and sent him. We have to stop here because I have something to attend to. Inshallah ta'ala, we'll continue from here tomorrow. Uh, I didn't realize the time. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Inshallah, let us recite al-Fatiha to the soul of al-Imam Ali bin Hussein Zain al-Abidin al-Sajjad al-Fatiha. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send us medit, divine assistance from his direction. Verily, in the awliya is a sanctuary. In that good belief and conviction of them, there is a sanctuary for us, a safety. May Allah make us among them. Barakallahu bikum. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.